long ago, in a land called Hindustan, reigned a dynasty of kings as cultured as they were courageous. It isn't that they were without fault. They could be cruel and cunning warriors. But they were also men of exceptionally good taste and blessed with the bountiful means to express their vision they built a splendid empire of beauty knowledge and grace beyond any known before now there was one among them called king of the world whose heart's passion burned like fire and who built a monument for the sake of love that would capture the imagination of the world. At the age of 15, the prince who would be king of the world met a refined and high-born young girl at a bazaar within the walls of the royal palace in Agra. Court poets celebrated the girl's extraordinary beauty. The moon, they said, hid its face in shame before her. For both, it was love at first sight. Five years would pass before the auspicious day chosen for their wedding. And from that moment, they became inseparable companions. Although the prince was not the eldest son of his father, the Emperor Jahangir, he was the favorite. In art, in reason, in battle, there is no comparison between him and my other children. To honor the prince for his many victorious military campaigns, Jahangir grants him the title Shah Jahan, King of the World, a tribute never before paid to an uncrowned Mughal king. But when Jahangir's health fails, his son's rival for succession. Ultimately, Shah Jahan is victorious, and in 1628, he ascends the throne. Beside him stands his queen, his comrade and confidant. He titles her Mumtaz Mahal, chosen one of the palace, and commissions for her a luxurious royal residence In turn, she gives him tender devotion, wise counsel, and children, many children, to ensure the continuance of the magnificent Mughal dynasty. The citadels of glory the prince is destined to inherit. Shah Jahan's ancestry is no ordinary birthright. He is descended from the merciless Mongol invader Genghis Khan and the infamous Amir Timur, who ruled the vast and civilized lands of Persia. But by the early 1500s, struggles for succession had divided the mighty Central Asian Empire into small warring kingdoms, driving one young prince to look south into Hindustan for a dominion of his own. The land was not well defended, and Babur the Tiger soon conquered what is now northern India. But when the dust settled, he was dismayed to see the spoils of his victory. Hindustan is a place of little charm. There are no refined arts or other delights of urbane society, and the heat and dust are unbearable. On the other hand, it is a large country with lots of gold and jewels. Like his Persian ancestors, 
Babur was as much a scholar and poet as a soldier, and he longed for the luxury, culture, and landscapes of his homeland. In 1526, on the banks of the Yamuna River at Agra, he laid out a garden to rival any in Persia, and endowed his successors with a small kingdom and a passion for beauty. He was the first in a series of emperors of North India called Mughals, and they gave the term Mughal to the English world. Mughal means someone of tremendous wealth and tremendous power. Hollywood Mughals, Wall Street Mughals. The first three emperors, they were out actually establishing the wealth of the dynasty, defeating rebels, building their power, building up the empire. A good name for kings is achieved by means of lofty buildings. Babur's grandson, Akbar the Great, firmly established Mughal supremacy in northern India. He was the Grand Mughal, renowned even in the most distant corners of the civilized world. Manifesting the ancestral love of the arts on a monumental scale, Akbar filled the landscape with cities of royal pleasure and comfort, designed to dazzle the native Rajas and promote the glory of the dynasty. This is the first time you had wealth at that level uh, interested really in commissioning the arts and commissioning the arts that were uh, in particular meant to be the arts uh, embodying and confirming wealth. In the capital of Agra, Akbar's towering red fort held more than 500 buildings within its massive walls. Pavilions and residences to accommodate his considerable court. And a storehouse for the gold and jewels of the empire. For the sake of a throne, the purse of the earth was emptied of treasure. The reign of Akbar's grandson, Shah Jahan, marks the long summer of Mughal rule. It is an age of outrageous opulence, and a time when some of the world's largest and most precious gems are being mined from India's soil. There were literally trunks of jewels in the imperial treasury, trunks of nothing but emeralds, of uh, sapphires and rubies and diamonds. Shah Jahan inherited it all. The six thrones left to him by his ancestors are set aside, and he commissions another encrusted with hundreds of jewels. He wanted himself to be seen as a symbol of perfection, the perfection of a jewel so carefully crafted and so flawless that there could be no question at all of the kind of vagaries of a human personality. Like his grandfather, Shah Jahan's passion is architecture. Not content with the buildings of Akbar, he replaces them with palaces of pure white marble. The splendor of his court outshines those of his ancestors. Inscribed on the arches of his throne are the words, If there be paradise on earth, it is here. But in this world there is an ancient tradition. Sweet pleasure is not without bitterness. In 1631, Mumtaz Mahal suffers complications during the birth of her 14th child. According to legend, with her dying breath, she secures a promise from her husband on the strength of their love. To build for her a mausoleum more beautiful than any the world had ever seen. The king cried out with grief like an ocean raging with storm. 
He put aside his royal robes and for the whole week afterward his majesty did not appear in public nor transact any affairs of state. From constant weeping he was forced to use spectacles and his hair turned gray. Shah Jahan grieves for two years By official opinion, he never again shows enthusiasm for administering the realm. Six months after the death of his wife, he lays the foundation for a memorial across the Yamuna River near his palace in Agra. Upon her grave he constructed such an edifice that since the divine decree drew creation's plan, no one has seen its equal in magnificence. To satisfy his artistic obsession, vast quantities of white marble are mined from the quarries in Rajasthan. Red sandstone is carted from Delhi. A 10-mile long ramp is built through Agra, so materials can be dragged to the construction site. So great is the scope of the project that a city grows up around the grounds to house the 20,000 workers who will labor over 20 years to build this monument. Architects and artisans are summoned to the palace from as far as Baghdad and the Ottoman courts of Turkey. The masterful architects bring designs before the exalted sight of the emperor. And since his mind is inclined entirely toward the building, he attends to it fully by carrying out appropriate changes. There are daily consultations there are considerations and compromises. Above all, there is devotion to the memory of Mumtaz Mahal. O thou soul at peace, return thou unto thy Lord. These are the gardens of Eden. Enter them and live forever. The Mughals were followers of the Islamic faith. The promise of Allah as written in the Quran is inscribed in marble on the portal of the main entrance to the Taj Mahal. Symbolic of the gateway through which Muhammad entered paradise, it is a place of transition between the world of the senses and the realm of the spirit. As you enter the gate, the Taj is framed within the doorway and it looks small and very dainty. As you walk closer to it, its magnificence just takes over. Reflected in a long pool is the mausoleum in all its majesty. Four minarets frame the space like the setting of a jewel. Subtle variations in the veined marble create changes in color with every mood of the heavens. The sky forms a curtain to the Taj. It's the backdrop. And the way it's set on that platform, standing up against this huge expanse of the sky, it seems as though they were evoking the sort of heavenly curtain to play a part in the scheme of things. The 42 acres of grounds were once an oasis 
where fountains sprang from channels of water, filling the air with their music. Where the air was cooled and scented by a profusion of trees and flowers. This is the paradise which the righteous have been promised. It is watered by running streams, eternal are its fruits, and eternal are its shades. According to Islamic tradition, a woman who dies in childbirth is a martyr and her memorial a place of pilgrimage. Two structures face the Taj from either side. A mosque on the west, its mirror image a rest house on the east, built for the faithful who would come to praise Allah and pay homage to Mumtaz Mahal. Though the Taj Mahal is said to be the most perfect building in the world, it is not without precedent. Everything has a tradition. Shah Jahan must have seen his great-grandfather's tomb, Humayun's tomb, in Delhi. Must have gone for the annual death anniversary celebrations as a young boy and must have been inspired by it. And right from the very beginning, we've got a synthesis of Hindu and Islamic elements of architecture. The formal symmetry recalls Persia, and the bulbous dome is pure Islamic. But the roof is crowned with small domed kiosks from Indian tradition. The finials and inverted lotus are familiar Hindu designs and the facade is covered with Delhi's distinctive red sandstone. Commissioned under Akbar's rule, the tomb built for his father Humayun was the first major construction of the distinctly Mughal style of architecture. In Hindu architecture, we use the engineering principle of the beam on top of two pillars. So uh, a Hindu construction has lots and lots of pillars with these beams on top and you can't keep the space between the pillars too wide because the beam would collapse in the middle. With Islam came a new engineering principle, the concept of the arch. And with this principle you could span very wide spaces. So you had huge doorways and huge spaces within the building. Akbar's own tomb is a medley of architectural styles, displaying more interest in experimentation than harmony of design. Although the essential character of the Mughal style is Islamic, many of the details are Hindu. Akbar was a very eccentric king, a very great emperor, of course, and chose to synthesize a lot of Indian culture into his own culture and philosophy. And the Islamic rulers used the native artists and craftsmen to build their monuments. India's craftsmen are masters of stone carving and the art of inlay, preferring graceful motifs from nature to formal geometric designs. These embellishments provide the finishing touch in the Mughal style. At the tomb of Jahangir's chief minister, Itmud Uddala, white marble and inlaid ornamentation cover every surface. They started using ceramic tiles and then precious stones. We've got buildings right from 13th, 14th century, 
where the beginning of this inlay work starts. And by the 17th century, of course, the Mughals perfected it. The contrast between Akbar's rugged constructions and the refinement of this tomb underscores the evolution of the empire to a state of pure luxury. Now, the movement to the Taj is really a very small step because all the architectural techniques, all the engineering principles, all the details had been experimented with. It's a supreme culmination of many experiments that went before and that's why it's so perfect. From afar, the Taj appears seamless, but moving closer reveals an intricate harmony of details. Inlaid calligraphy flows with all the freedom of a pen moving across paper. Jewel-studded walls display exquisitely detailed flowers. You've got inlay work of, of flowers about three inches high, where they use as many as 60 to 70 pieces of uh, precious gemstones to show the curve of a leaf or the turn of a petal. I mean, it's so delicate. Precious stones were brought by caravan from all corners of the empire and beyond. Jasper from the Punjab, Carnelian from Baghdad, Turquoise from Tibet. Over 40 types of gems in all. Stone is set within stone, as bold and precise as the dark spot within the tulip's heart. Those red and yellow flowers that dispel the heart's grief. In the center of the mausoleum lie the remains of Mumtaz Mahal. Subdued light filters through the delicate screen surrounding her cenotaph, and mullahs chant verses from the Quran. It is here that Shah Jahan comes with his children to honor the memory of his wife. Here, at last, he finds solace. But Shah Jahan's tranquility is suddenly shattered when his son Aurangzeb assails the throne. Aurangzeb has little interest in the arts and disapproves of his father's lavish lifestyle, accusing him of squandering the treasury on frivolous constructions. As a pious Muslim, Aurangzeb wishes to revoke the policies of religious tolerance in place since Akbar's reign. In 1658, he declares himself emperor and imprisons his ailing father in a tower of the Agra fort. For Shah Jahan, king of the world, who once commanded the unbounded wealth of an empire, his only consolation now is a view across the Yamuna River to his vision of paradise. Eight years later, acknowledging the deep love between his parents, Aurangzeb buries Shah Jahan next to Mumtaz Mahal. The new cenotaph, placed to the side, is the only apparent imbalance in the entire Taj Mahal complex.
The reign of Mughals from Akbar to Shah Jahan had been an era of relative peace and unrivaled prosperity in India. But strained by a diminishing treasury and Aurangzeb's rigid governance, the empire began to crumble. By 1857, India was ripe for conquest, and British rule replaced the Mughal dynasty. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the romantic allure of the East made India the favored destination for European travelers. The monuments of Agra turned into pleasure resorts for picnics and midnight rendezvous. Eventually, the grounds became overgrown and the tomb desecrated by vandals. For a time, it seemed that even the Taj. Like the Mughals, might vanish. A plan to sell the marble piece by piece was called off, only for lack of prospective buyers. After years of neglect, a restoration program was begun by the British Viceroy to India, Lord Curzon, at the end of the 19th century. The work continued under the Archaeological Survey, and the building. Of Agra, including the Taj, were restored to something of their former glory. The Taj is the symbol of India. It's the synthesis of many religions, many architectural forms, many artistic traditions. It's a symbol of love and of great beauty. Chaos and the changing world outside, and this perfect still garden that's perpetually beautiful inside. Excellent the sepulcher of the lady's fame, that a cradle for the princess of the world became. Inspired by love, and shaped to perfection, the jewel of India, the far-famed Taj. But fame comes late to another treasure, lost in obscurity. For a thousand years, in 1814, two hundred men crossed the lush Kedu plains of central Java to search out a legendary mountain near the small village of Boro. For six weeks, they slash and burn the choking vegetation. They clear away tons of volcanic ash. Hidden beneath the debris, they find strange figures carved in stone. Thousands of them.
It is said that a heavenly architect built the mountain of a thousand statues in a single day and laid a curse on anyone who dared ascend his holy shrine to see them. Javanese records show that in 1758, a rebellious young prince of Jogjakarta defied the curse. When the prince returned home, he was stricken with a sudden illness and died. The excavation of the monument known as Borobudur had been ordered by Sir Thomas Stanford Raffles, the new British governor of Java. Unlike the Dutch traders before him, Raffles is intrigued by the exotic stories and architecture of the Indonesian islands. The antiquities of Java have not, till lately, excited much notice, nor have they yet been sufficiently explored. The pursuits of commerce have been too exclusive to allow there being much interest in the subject. When Raffles comes to inspect the progress of his expedition, he finds a colossal pyramid rising to a huge bell-shaped pinnacle. The ruin of Barabador is remarkable for its grandeur in design. The building is square and composed of terraces rising one within the other, each enclosed by stone walls. On the walls are carved in the most beautiful style panels containing historical scenes and ceremonies. Nearly 3,000 panels encircle the monument. Indigenous plant life is depicted in such detail that specific species can be identified. methods of rice farming remain unchanged. Javanese animals share the walls with mythological creatures. There are scenes of abundance and joyful celebration. All evidence of a once thriving culture. Borobudur illustrates the patronage which the arts and sciences must have received and the inexhaustible wealth and resources which the Javanese of those times must have possessed. In a time long before Europeans discovered the Spice Islands, great Javanese ships sailed the seas. They carried tons of rice and hardwoods from the fertile island to the ports of Malaysia, China, and India in exchange for the exotic provisions of a prosperous existence. But by Raffles' time, the glory of Java has faded and no one can remember when or why Borobudur had been built. The natives have long ceased to respect the temples and idols of former worship, though they still view the ruins with superstitious reverence. The Javanese had been converted to Islam during the 15th century and Raffles thinks it unlikely that Barabador would have been built since then. 
Records also show that in the 10th century, the region had been mysteriously deserted. Perhaps the nearby Mount Merapi had erupted, choking the ricelands with layers of volcanic ash. Whatever the cause, the population moved to East Java in a mass exodus, and Borobudur was left behind. Lacking further historical evidence, Raffles is unable to determine the exact date of Barabador's construction, but he does have some insight into the purpose of the structure. The resemblance of the images which surround this temple to the figure of Buddha has introduced an opinion that Barabador was exclusively confined to the worship of that deity. As word of the discovery spreads, scholars of Asian religions visit. They recognize Borobudur as the largest Buddhist temple in the world, and the most unique. In ancient times, pilgrims may have come from all over Southeast Asia to study at Borobudur. The panels depict the teachings of the Buddha. Each familiar story, a step in the pilgrim's progress. Each terrace, a higher plane of consciousness. There is no central sanctuary in this temple. Instead, the more than three miles of galleries that ring the structure are designed to guide the faithful on a spiritual journey. Borobudur is a three-dimensional road map to enlightenment. The Buddha was once reborn as a woodpecker. One day he met a lion who had a bone caught in his throat and was suffering horribly. The woodpecker propped open the lion's mouth with a bit of wood and walked into it to remove the bone. Though the woodpecker was very hungry, the lion would not share any of his meal. This saddened the woodpecker. But he did not take revenge. Good deeds do not necessarily occasion any reward other than the pleasure of doing someone else a good turn. Ascending the eastern stairway to the first gallery, pilgrims follow the journey of the Buddha through his 500 earthly reincarnations. The future Buddha can be reborn as a king, he can be reborn as an animal, he can be reborn as a monk, all kinds of possibilities. But each time that he is reborn, he practices all kinds of good deeds. Repetition is essential. 500 times the message has to be repeated, repeated, repeated. And in all these existences, he accumulates all the merit, all the wisdom, all the insight that he needs to come well prepared into his last earthly existence, which is the existence as the Prince Siddhartha, who becomes the Buddha. The panels then chronicle the experiences of the young prince as he travels for the first time beyond the palace walls. Once outside, Siddhartha encounters the harsh realities of the world. He sees sickness and death. And he begins to realize 
that life is suffering and that there must be a way out of this. Siddhartha comes to understand that all suffering is caused by unfulfilled desire. Only by extinguishing desire does he achieve enlightenment and become the Buddha. The panels of the next three tiers of Borobudur tell the story of a young disciple named Sudana. He serves as a role model for those who wish to learn the teachings of the Buddha. And so he goes from one teacher to the other, a ship's captain, a banker, nuns, monks, two kings, even the god Shiva is among them. Each one of them gives him a little piece of the truth. At the end of his life, the Buddha's disciples asked him what kind of monument he'd like built in his memory. The Buddha replied, a stupa. The disciples were mystified. What is a stupa, one asked. In answer, the Buddha overturned his alms bowl and stood his walking stick on top of it. When Sudana is ready to leave his teachers and pass beyond the world of existence, he enters the realm of contemplation, and the pilgrim ascends from the cluttered galleries to the expansive upper terraces. A huge stupa crowns Borobudur. Within the 72 surrounding stupas, the pilgrim finds the Buddha in sublime meditation. This stark contrast between the phenomenal world and the ethereal world of formlessness at the top is one of the most brilliant inventions of the architects of Borobudur. Despite Raffles' best intentions, uncovering Borobudur has placed it in grave danger, as reports of the exotic temple attract a new breed of pilgrim. Souvenir hunters decapitate many of the Buddhas and ship them to mansions and museums throughout the world. For the weary tourist, a tea house is built high on the crumbling central stupa. Many of the Europeans who came to Asia, and many of the Asians themselves because they had been converted to Islam, regarded these monuments as the work of heathen. And this prevented them from appreciating their true beauty. But in 1885, an accidental discovery rekindles interest in preserving this ancient treasure. J.W. Iserman, a Dutch architect involved in a restoration project, walks along the high processional path that surrounds the base of Borobudur. And he noticed that the moldings of the wall continued underneath a crack that he saw in the floor. This meant that all these stones must have been added at a time when part of the building was already finished. Iserman excitedly calls for a section of the path to be removed. When 16 layers of stone have been pulled away, Iserman discovers another tier of panels, quite unlike those of the upper galleries. These are portrayals of hellish tortures mixed with scenes of sweet pleasures. 
In all, 160 panels are uncovered. But it is not until the hidden panels are linked to the Buddhist doctrine of karma that their significance is understood. These are the ground rules of what happens to you, you know, whether you are reborn as a human, as an animal, in hell or in heaven. It is the cosmic law of cause and effect. Saying ugly things about others in this life results in rebirth as an ugly person. Those who mistreat animals will be trampled by elephants. The dishonest will be tortured with a hot iron. It also goes in the positive way. If you donate a bell to a temple, in your next incarnation you will have a melodious voice. Eisenman finds that a few scenes have been left unfinished with instructions to the stone carver inscribed in Sanskrit. The style of lettering is so distinctive that it can be dated to the middle of the 9th century. Experts conclude that Barabadur must have been built by the Silindra kings who ruled in central Java at that time. But why had they covered the laws of karma? the foundation of Buddhist belief. Some people think there's a symbolic reason. I tend to think that it was as they were building the monument, it started sagging, and in order to keep it in place, they built this heavy stone ring around the monument. Eiserman reaches the same conclusion. After photographing the panels, he replaces the original pathway to re-stabilize the structure. But as Barabador's past becomes more clear, its future grows much less certain. The sediment and plant life that had shrouded Barabador for so many centuries had also protected it from the elements. As the galleries are cleared, the porous volcanic stone is exposed to Java's relentless heat and torrential downpours. Nature itself is destroying the monument. Water seeps through the cracks, undermining the temple's earthen core, buckling floors, pushing out walls. Half an hour after a heavy rainfall, all the water came out, uh, depositing all kind of sediment on the stones, which led to the growth of all kinds of lichen and mosses and whatnot. And the monument was in pretty bad shape. Throughout most of the 19th century, Borobudur suffers more damage than in the thousand years before. In 1907, Theodore van Erp, a Dutch engineering officer, leads a major restoration project. He rebuilds the crumbling stupas and heaving floors of the upper terraces. But after four years, the limited funds are exhausted before work can begin on the lower galleries. Carvings are now rapidly disintegrating. Walls are crumbling. And the whole structure is in danger of tumbling down the hill in one enormous archaeological avalanche. But it would be several decades before attention would again turn to Barabadur.
there was once a terrible drought. And a Brahmin told the king he would have to sacrifice 100 living beings to bring it to an end. Unable to do this, the king proclaimed that he would select the necessary victims from among his worst subjects. At this news, his subjects all became virtuous, and the drought stopped. In 1968, the Indonesian government and the United Nations, working through UNESCO, launch a campaign to save Borobudur. Over the next 15 years, $20 million are raised to support a bold plan. The complete dismantling and reconstruction of the lower terraces, stone by stone. Thirteen hundred carved panels are taken apart and individually cleaned, catalogued, and treated for preservation. Over one million stones are moved during the course of restoration and set aside like pieces of a massive jigsaw puzzle. Professionals from 27 countries join their Indonesian counterparts to carry out the project. Borobudur becomes a testing ground for new conservation techniques, new procedures to battle the microorganisms eating away at the stone. Experts in engineering, chemistry, biology and archaeology all share their skills to solve the multitude of problems. The project takes eight years of labor and unprecedented international cooperation to complete. Borobudur has served as a place of learning, dedication, and training for those who follow the path of the Buddha and those who labored to preserve this cultural treasure. According to Buddhist philosophy, such cooperation in the monumental construction effort would have earned everyone involved great merit in their quest for enlightenment. Perhaps the builders of Borobudur hoped for just such a legacy.